Hey, Pastor Steve Waldron, glad you're here with us today. We're going to be looking at a Bible. I didn't know much about the Farrar Fenton Bible. Modern English 1903 uses the Masoretic text and the Westcott and Hort text. We're going to take a little bit of a deeper dive. All this coming from Wikipedia, common knowledge, but anyhow, it's just good stuff. The Holy Bible in Modern English, commonly known as the Ferrer Fenton Bible, is an early translation of the Bible into English as spoken and written in the 19th and 20th centuries. So like John 3.16 in it reads, and it's a literal translation, For God so loved the world that He gave the only begotten Son that everyone believing in Him should not be lost but have eternal life. So here's the origins. Here's where it comes from. Believing the Christian faith would be lost unless a modern version of the English Bible was produced. London businessman for our Fenton 1832 to 1920 began working on a translation of the Bible in 1853. He published his translation of Paul's epistles in 1883 and other parts of the Bible in years following. The complete Bible was first published in 1903 with revisions published in subsequent years until 1910. Fenton spent approximately 50 years working on his translation with the goal to study the Bible absolutely in its original languages to ascertain what its writers actually said and thought. Fenton had acquired a learning and understanding of ancient Sanskrit, Greek, Hebrew, and Latin through being a distinguished member of the Royal Asiatic Society. As a tradesman, he also had access to numerous ancient Septuagint and Masoretic manuscripts to aid in translation. I found this interesting. He also used Brian Walton's Polyglot Bible, 1657. I think I've got a review of that on the channel as well for minimal referencing. I know I've talked about it some. I don't know if I did a video just tall on that and, and this is another neat thing about this translation the translation is noted for rearranging of the books of the bible so that fenton believed was the correct chronological order the old testament this order follows the hebrew bible the name of god was translated throughout the old testament as the ever living all caps with a hyphen between ever and living but to a lesser degree is all caps lord and to a much lesser degree jehovah such as in numbers 15. The Bible is described as translated in English direct from the original Hebrew, Chaldee, and Greek languages. For his translation of the book of Job, which appeared in 1898, Fenton was assisted by Heinrich Borgström. This was rendered into the same meter as the original Hebrew, word by word, line by line. His translation of the New Testament is based on the Greek text of Westcott and Hort, and was approved by many professors and theologians. And I think I may have been seeing it over the years as the modern English Bible. Not the MEV, but the MEB. MEV is something different. Uh, New Textus Receptus Bible. Fenton's translation, 9th edition, 1905, includes an added page listing these exact authorities. The ordering novelty in the New Testament is it places the Gospel of John and the first epistle of John at the beginning before the Gospel of Matthew, thus placing the Acts of the Apostles immediately after the Gospel of Luke. Fitton included the introductory note to explain this ordering, which reads, The gospel, especially the doctrinal record of our Lord's life, the great teacher has here elaborated the thought and purpose of God concerning his plan of salvation by a gift, and upon this base has been formulated and propagated the doctrines of Christian faith. The record should therefore precede the historical narratives. There's ample reason for believing, this is neat, the primacy of John, that the gospel of John was written at an earlier date than those of the other three evangelists. And I've kind of noticed that because Mark, Luke, and Matthew all refer to destroy this temple in three days, they'll build it again. That's in John 2. It's not in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. And uh, so I have no problem with an early date of John. We get that from, in my opinion, very unreliable sources like Papias and others called Church Fathers. The more you study the Church Fathers, the more you realize victors write history, and they only saved very select, it seems, that kind of propagated certain uh, eventualities of their doctrine. Also notable is Farrar Fenton's restoration of the Psalms into the musical verse form as close to the original as you can get. The Psalms were, quite literally, songs complete with instructions for the choir master, as well as descriptions of the appropriate musical instruments to be used. His translations of Psalm 23, 48, and 137 are still sung in churches today, albeit to tunes not the original. 
And so that's all cool. And, you know, when you have many churches do the Psalms and meter and all this. Um, now, I'm not going to read this whole paragraph, but he translates Jonah 2.1 not as a whale or a sea creature, but as a, a ship. <laughs> and I think that's pretty uh, amazing. Fenton inserted his assumed dates for various sections. His method resulted in Samson's relationship with Delilah, spanning the time from B.C. 1138 to B.C. 1121, Judges 16, 4 through 22. Um, Fitton included footnotes at the bottom of many pages of his translation to aid the reader on linguistic or historical matters as well as to offer his personal opinion on certain topics. For example, the lengthy note was added to the end of Genesis 11, which explains Fitton's own solution to the problems of the patriarchs' great ages. He says, We may safely conclude that the patriarchs of such apparently incredible length of life were actually priest chiefs of tribes whose souls were believed to have passed from the first organizer of the tribe. Fenton believed the great longevity of the patriarchs can be explained if those names were tribal houses or clan appellations. I've got a friend that believes something similar to that in another part of Scripture. Fenton believed that the Greek text of the Gospel of John is a translation of an original Hebrew work. I found that interesting, too, of the Apostle in the Greek, according to a footnote at the end of John 1. Now, I don't necessarily agree with that. Anyhow. So it was fairly popular. These 10 editions of Fenton's translation were published in his own lifetime. It goes into that. It's still printed by Destiny Publishers of Merrimack, Massachusetts. I found this fascinating, too. For our Fenton was a British Israelite, and he dedicated his translation to all those nations who have sprung up from the race of the British Isles. An explanatory note in the abridged version of the command of the ever-living quotes of better, a letter Fenton wrote in 1910 describing his belief that the Simru Welsh language sprang from ancient Hebrew and that the British were descended from Shem. You know, as far as Welsh goes, I, <laughs> that may be true Welsh. I, I've looked at Welsh kind of, I don't know, superficially, and it is a unique language. Anyhow, some modern brain, but I haven't done enough to know that it came from Hebrew or anything. Some modern branches of British Israelite lean heavily on the Farrar Fenton translation in order to support their theories. So the Holy Bible in modern English, I think that's what I've just kind of known it as over the years. So that is absolutely amazing. The making of Bibles, I jokingly say there is no end. So God bless. Hey, thanks for being with us. Check out our playlist. Check out our other videos. We try to be a repository of Christian knowledge here. Just want truth in all of its wonderful forms. God bless. Love you. Thanks for being with us. Share. Put it on social media. And join us daily. Talk with you later. Bye-bye.